become convinced it becomes from the suffering of the African American community in Georgia. And it's, uh, it's quite amazing to me. So uh, having said that, um, well, I let me just add as we're, yes. as, a, as a, a very uh, felt like a wounded pastor, I left a white church and went to uh, a multiracial church with an African American pastor. And I am experiencing a very different reality than Isn't I think it? it's amazing. It is truly amazing. amazing. So uh, the call, the call of this entire conversation may be about our conversion. However, I won't do that. Um, there's so much I would like to say uh, to both what Leah proposed for us and what Lewis has given a framework for biblical studies. Um, I want to add another question. Um, what happens if you use trauma theory? to read biblical texts. And um, I'm going to mention really rapidly some things about Jeremiah, and then I'm going to move to Genesis if I have some time, and I'll try not to talk too much, and Conrad, you can stop me. Anybody can stop me. Um, so, um, the book of Jeremiah, addresses the trauma and historical trauma, the, the likely disappearance of the people of Israel, Judah, the likely disappearance to in the Babylonian empire. They have been conquered. They have been three invasions, destruction of all of their institutions. They're gone. The leadership is transported to exile. But even those who are still in the city of Jerusalem, they have been displanted, displaced to the northern part of Judah. So there's not anybody in that community who is, or there are probably a few, but mostly the community is a displaced community. And the people of Judah in 587 all the way down to uh, 590, in the 90s to the 80s, these people look around and they remember their own northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, that has been destroyed by the Assyrian invasion 200 years earlier. And that invasion lays out what might happen to them. They'll be absorbed by the conquerors. They'll be taken over. And the conquerors' gods will become their gods, and they will disappear as a people. And as Lewis has said in some of his work, they don't disappear because of biblical texts, because that's what they're addressing, particularly the prophets. And we can name, you've already named several, but what Jeremiah does is several of the things Leah was getting to think about. It, in my opinion, it helps the community re-enter the trauma of military invasion and destruction. It does it with some poems right at the beginning of the book about the foe from the north. What's the foe from the north? If people were trying to identify people, historical people. The foe from the north is a mythic symbolic representation of an invasion that is so powerful, it's as if it's otherworldly. The foe from the north comes on chariots of horses in the sky coming to attack the city. Okay, why does it attack the city? Because the people are whores, they're harlots, they're people who have turned to other gods and therefore they're being described as sinners. Okay, how is that text a helpful text? It seems so foreign and alien to us. Well, I think it's doing what Leah said needs to be done after trauma. This is collective trauma. It's inviting the people into their historical, horribly traumatic, violent experiences, and it's doing it at a distance. It's telling them a story about something, a battle that's going on in the sky. And so they can see some of their own experience without re-entering it whole hog and being re-traumatized. 
So it tells the story as if in a movie or on a stage or in a screen. And the traumas all the way through Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the prophetic literature seem to me to be doing that in a variety of ways. But it's doing something a little more. When it says you're being invaded because you're harlots, you're sinners, you turn to other gods, other lovers, it's giving, it's giving an interpretation, a cause and effect that I totally reject personally, it's giving cause and effect. Now, maybe you can watch the five o'clock news and see somebody in a house that's coming out of their house. The house is just burned down. Why did that happen? Why did that happen? Oh my God, why did that happen? And then they start thinking up reasons that it happened. Well, I'd say that the prophetic literature is doing something like that when it understands the cause of catastrophe to be their own behavior. Their own behavior does two things, to blame themselves, which the literature does. It does two things. It gives them a sense of agency because they can change their behavior and in the future, it won't happen again. But it also keeps their relationship with the Holy One, with the God of Israel in place. God didn't do this to us. God is not dismantling the church. We're dismantling the church. God didn't do it. It's because of our behavior. This is, this. I think Leah might tell us, is what children do when their parents blame them or their parents are angry at them. They blame themselves whether they have any culpability or not. And so I think this is a theological survival strategy. The prophetic literature does this again and again. Jeremiah does more. Jeremiah himself is the person known as the weeping prophet. Why is he the weeping prophet? Because of his own confessions. As the prophet, he is talking about how the world is collapsing, his own sorrow. And he talks about, in the, the process of this literature, he talks about a God who is also weeping. His confessions and the stories about him show so much grief. They invite the audience, which I argue, along with Leah, are traumatized. They're benumbed by the violence that has befallen their community. So those are two little hints of ways. But something more happens that does what Lewis was looking for and, and knows about more than I do. Um, every story about the prophet Jeremiah is a story in which he personally undergoes the very things that happen to the community. He has suffered, attacked, and rejected. He is beaten. He's put in a pit to be left for dead. He is whipped in the stocks. He is held captive. But every single story in which I think in the person of one, the violent attacks on the community are enacted in a, what was the word you used, titrated way? In a, let's say in a micro way, on one instead of on everybody, um, he survives every one of them. And so the prophet enacts hope because he is the ultimate survival, survivor. He's also, by the way, exiled, like some of his community, to Egypt, kicked out of his, goes out of his own country. So, what I'm trying to suggest about this literature, just with a hint about the trauma that's involved in it, is that the, the individual prophet experiences what happens. The prophet goes through what they need to go through. The people again and again come up with cause and effect. The principal cause and effect for the collapse of the nation in Jeremiah is the people's sinfulness. But I have argued that that's a theological survival strategy. 
Um, and I think um, that that's something something further is going on. In in the book of Jeremiah, there's an effort to re um, to place the catastrophe in a larger frame of reference. Again and again, what happens, the suffering that happens gets a larger picture. It doesn't get erased, it doesn't get suppressed, but it's given a larger frame of reference. For example, there will be a new covenant. This becomes a larger theological picture. And I'm not remembering what I said about that, so you'll have to go read my book to find out what I think about that. But I, it, if I'm not going too fast, tell me, am I going too fast? Should I pause here? Because I'm like um, the Energizer Bunny when you get me talking, I'm afraid. Anybody want me to clarify, slow down? Okay, I want to turn to Genesis. This is real, way too much of a, of a leap. But I've been working on Genesis recently, so it's much fresher for me, and I can illustrate my points about trauma theory as a lens for interpreting the Bible. Um, and so I was asked to write a commentary on um, Genesis, and I put it aside to do all this work with trauma theory and Jeremiah. And it turned out to be quote unquote providential um, because I suddenly had trauma theory as a lens. I was reading along, I was gonna talk about the theme about the God of all nations. That was gonna be my big thing. But then I got to the story of the flood. The story of the flood and suddenly my eyes were open and I came to the recognition that the flood story is a disaster narrative. That the book of Genesis is packed with disaster narratives. The flood story is one of them. The Sodom and Gomorrah story is another one. Cain and Abel story is one of them. The Garden of Eden is a disaster. In each case, it looks like there's an end coming. And the most painful one of all is the so-called sacrifice or binding of Isaac in chapter 22. The, the thing that every pastor says, oh no, I have to preach about that one again. It is so difficult to preach about because it presents us with a God who is testing Abraham, who, who sends Abraham to take his son, his beloved son, his only son, his beloved son to the mountain and sacrifice and murder him. Now, this is really ridiculous from one level because the first from chapter 10 to 22, we've been looking for the birth of the child. The child comes in chapter 21 and in virtually the next chapter, he's being told to sacrifice the child. And what it does is it tells us how to interpret it. We interpret it as God testing Abraham, the faith of Abraham. It's usually interpreted as a narrow one man, one God relationship. But what if this story is a disaster narrative? that tells the story of the people symbolically through the figure of Abraham and his only beloved son. He's not his only son, but nonetheless, it's called his only beloved son. What happens if you think of it that way? You have there a different interpretation of why the disaster happened, happened as a test. That's a, that's a common it's a common response from individuals trying to claim meaning out of horrible things that happened to them in the context of their faith. God was testing me. I have to hold fast. In the story of Noah's flood, what was the reason the flood happened? 
the reason is given the beginning in chapter six, six to nine or the flood story. It begins at the implication. It's implied. It's not stated as clearly. The implication, the flood happens because the sons of God, no, the sons, wait a minute. Yeah, the sons of God up in heaven have sex with the daughters of humans. What? What is that exactly about? It's sort of, it's as if the boundaries are broken between the divine world and the human world, but God doesn't get mad at the sons of God, the heavenly beings. God gets mad at the humans, even though it's a, it's a rape story in which the women are raped by these male beings out of the sky. So what is that about? Well, my... Uh, designation of disaster narratives points um, points to some kind of confused mythic effort to find meaning in this catastrophe, if, if my reading is correct, if, in this catastrophe and can't find an easy explanation and humans get blamed again. Theological survival strategy. God is testing us, a theological survival strategy. Relationship stays intact. Okay, let me try to give just a little bit bigger picture here. So uh, there's several of these stories. I think they're all doing the same thing. I think they're all attempting to help the community still much later after Jeremiah or to help the community still face what's happened to them. But just the way you can go to a movie and you find yourself seen in that movie, even though it's about something really weird, but there's your life experience. That's what I think the text, that's how it's functioning. And they can see themselves here and they can keep revisiting it in ever more crazy ways and yet their own lives. And they find, they find they are, they are ascribing different, several different explanations, explanations, interpretations of why it happened. So I think the book is doing that, but the book is moving past that. So I make some historical conclusions about this, that they've already done a lot of the work through the prophets, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. They've done a lot of their grieving. They've done a lot of facing the basic horrors of it through that literature. But Genesis, even though it's the first one in the Bible, comes late. And I'm not alone. Lewis and I are not alone in saying that. Our colleagues typically, historically, place Genesis very late. And so it's put at the beginning. And it contains these disaster things. But it begins with creation. It begins with a creator who brings life into being simply by speaking. And so I think the book of Genesis is addressing the traumatized community as after they've done a lot of their labor and is now pointing them toward a reinterpreted and open future. And the heart of the book of Genesis, of course, is the promises of God to Abraham and Sarah, or Abram and Sarai. It's the promises. And so then I started to think about the fact that the promises seem to concern things a destroyed nation needs. What do they need? They need children to have a future. And then there's so much impossibility around having a child. Can they possibly go forward? Because Sarah and Abraham, I mean, Sarai is post, post, post menopausal. It's not possible. Abraham is pretty much an old guy himself. They can't possibly have children. They try every possible way to get a child so that they have a future. And it comes miraculously. It comes to bring laughter and joy in the birth of Isaac. So, the child is born. Then God promises them. What else does God promise them? Land. They don't really get that in this book, though they keep returning to the land. Promises them a great name. And I wonder what that means. Well, I think that I, I actually think that it has to do with a nation that has been humiliated by um, by invasion and destruction. 
and who understand themselves as uh, recipients of future raising up, not unlike the prayer, the uh, prayer of Hannah that we started with. Um, and then I think, um, and then God promises them blessing. Well, they'd get a lot of blessings in Genesis, but it's not all realized. So this is promise, not reality. The only reality is that across the book, we go from one precarious birth that to um, uh, that of Isaac, and then we go through and we end up with 13 children of Jacob, and then we end up with 70 when we get down to Egypt with um, Joseph's with Joseph's family and the reunion, reuniting of Israel. So the, it, this, the whole story of Genesis then takes us through the history and brings us to a post-history. Now, I'm going to add one more thing and then I promise to stop. I want to say that the things that happen to the major, well, let me first say this. Every major character is a displaced person. And the only one who doesn't leave the land is Isaac. And Isaac's just like hardly has anything to do here. I think Isaac is a stand in for the people who remained in the land. The reasons, the reasons he can't leave the land are just completely befuddling. His father goes to sends a messenger to get him a get him a wife. He can't go out of the country. Why? Who knows? Is he going to run away? We don't know. There's no reason given. So to me, that becomes a clue that his identity is of the, rep the representative of the people who stay in the land. Whereas Jacob, if you read that, Jacob goes to his father-in-law place. He, he gets wealthy up there. He gets four wives. He gets 12 children. Then he comes back. They all come back to the land. And then we have the wonderful story of Joseph, who is held Who's, who sold them to slavery. And I think Egypt is the stand-in for Babylon. He has sold them to slavery. He has three or four efforts to escape. And finally, he gets raised up to the highest possible uh, place he could be as second in command to the uh, Pharaoh. Okay, what am I saying at 90 miles an hour? I am saying that I think this book is a perfect example of survival literature. I think it offers a re, uh, re invitation to see the terrible things that have happened to them in symbolic, titrated ways. My new vocabulary. Um, I think it offers little explanations for why it happened, but its principal contribution to the surviving nation is to give them hope for a future and promises that they need to survive in the world, in the land, to survive, period. And of course, it's postponed because you get to the end of Joseph's story and everybody's now in Egypt and then they're going to be there and then you're going to get the narrative all over again in the story of Exodus. It's the same story told, of course, in a very different way. So, um, what does it have to do with us? Well, um, to me, um, what does it have to do with our time? Um, I don't know, of course. But um, I think the book offers us testimony to their experience of the divine who has been with them and continues to be with them through all this trauma and violence and who has, will recreate them. So that's what I say to Conrad. This is about the recreation. It's not about creation. It's creation to talk about recreation. It's, I mean, of course it's about creation. Of course it's some historical memories, but it does, the book to me is not trying to teach us history. The book is trying to intervene in history. It's trying to buck everybody up to reform them, to give as God's people, to reunite them. And at the end of the book of Genesis, this is my last sentence, probably, um, at the end of the book of Genesis, 
we have an explanation about why these an explanation of why these things happened. You intended evil, but God intended it for good, that God could save survivors and there would be a future. So there is life, not death. And so that's what I think. Uh, and I left out a whole lot. So uh, may I ask you to respond, invite you to respond? Please, uh, Kathleen. Uh, anybody? Let me ask you, first of all, Kathleen, is it possible that it's both and? That it both is what? Both, both and. That is both and of what? Well, both. What I'm getting to is okay. it is a... It is a description, at least at some level of history, and of also course. a document to intervene in history. I think it is, because I do really believe there was someone named Abraham and someone named Sarah in their memory. I do believe there is someone named Jacob. I believe all that. But I don't think it's, it's the, I don't think the literature yes. functions the way modern Western intellectuals think history functions. I think that this carries history in order to build the world and that uh, who said what, when that's, that's memory used for surviving in our time. The screen is flicking around. So I'm, I'm missing you again. No, it's our Randall has his hand up. Okay. And so, to, okay, where's Randall? I don't see you, but Randall's please speak. Hi, Kathleen. Thank you. I, so I, I actually want to push back against your... Oh, hi, Randall. I, okay. I agree with modern Western intellectuals when I, when I kind of think of history in a particular way, but I think we do this all the time, right? It, we have reinterpreted 9-11 in how many different ways just in my short lifetime since I was in sixth grade, and it continues to be reinterpreted, right? Right. Um, 